Uh, good afternoon, good evening, and uh, good morning, wherever you are. So today we're going to talk about supramolecularly catenated and non-relieving polymerizations. And um, my name is uh, Professor Jim Kula from Case Western Research University. Uh, we are located in Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, at the part of the Purdue Center in Cleveland called University Circle. Uh, this is a picture of our building. My lab is at the fifth floor. And uh, you're welcome to visit us anytime. Now, uh, we do work a lot on uh, utilizing tools to investigate surfaces, different types of nanostructure, macromolecular structures. And uh, the type of work we do is focus on interfacial chemistry and functionalization, uh, different types of uh, patterning. Uh, today we're going to talk something quite different from what we do uh, traditionally in the sense that uh, we're very interested in topology or the ability to control the uh, catenation, crossover, uh, nattiness, uh, supramolecular chemistry of uh, long polymer chains or macromolecules. Before we do that, let's uh, uh, look at the perspective of knots. Uh, we are fascinated by knots, and I don't know yet who is not, uh, haven't met yet who is not. The reason is that uh, catenated structures, knots, chains are all over. As you can see here, um, art has taken uh, knots uh, in terms of um, pictures, different types of paintings, different types of uh, um, uses both in printed and uh, lithographed uh, type of uh, art forms from symbols. They're beautiful. In other words, uh, they fascinate us because uh, it, it gives us a uh, appreciation of uh, uh, geometry and uh, topology. In fact, one of my favorite artists is M.C. Escher. Uh, some of you are familiar with optical illusion or the ability to uh, to perceive uh, depth or uh, different types of uh, hidden uh, art or structures depending on the point of view of the viewer. And uh, amazingly, M.C. Escher uh, utilizes a lot of nuts, catenated structures in his art form. In fact, if at one time you were a Boy Scout, I'm very sure you're familiar with uh, uh, knots like sheep shank, global overhand, uh, figure eight knot, etc. Uh, obviously, uh, this has also a lot of practical uses. But uh, it's a skill that we learn as a Boy Scout uh, to tie these knots together and make uh, uh, very useful things with a rope. Now, what we don't realize is that nuts are also in uh, biomolecular um, functions or biochemistry. For example, nuts are actually present in DNA. In fact, DNA uh, is in unnatural form when it forms a nut. It spells trouble. It means the uh, uh, an evidence for a disease or uh, abnormality in the uh, DNA function. Uh, hopefully, what we have in the body are what we call DNA polymerases uh, or topoisomerases that actually correct this uh, circular DNA so that, that we don't get sick. Uh, in fact, uh, there are rarities. They can be observed or manipulated uh, even, as you can see in these nice uh, atomic force microscopy pictures of a catenated uh, DNA or uh, of a polymer that's been observed uh, by AFM. And here you can see the power of atomic force microscopy in uh, supramolecular chemistry. These are, these are all topological images that were probably taken in a mica surface because of the ability to maintain a flat surface versus that of the dimension of um, uh, people. In fact, we're going to learn much today 
about tree fall and gnats. We're going to start showing a tree fall gnat uh, today, and we're going to end up showing a tree fall gnat that we made ourselves uh, with uh, supramolecular chemistry. Tree fall gnats, as you can see here, have chirality that they have a uh, left-handed or a right-handed form. So uh, the question is, why don't we observe more trifold knots or more knotted systems in macromolecular chemistry? Well, first of all, uh, what are some of the interesting things uh, that we can expect? Uh, polymer chains entangle. Uh, they form um, entanglement, especially with high uh, molecular weights and uh, viscous conditions. On the other hand, uh, they may have some interesting um, ability to control crystallization or simply look at reputation or the dynamics of a polymer in solution. In other words, uh, if we are able to access um, knots or control entanglements in abundance, then we can have uh, the investigation of uh, new phase separation methods, um, black polymer function, rheology, rotation dynamics, surfactants, uh, and, and so on. And uh, this is as much a fascination to me as a synthetic polymer person as to that of a polymer physicist who are trying to model or simulate their properties. And uh, simply because there aren't too many uh, examples out there in terms of synthetic analogs. Uh, in polymer science, we are dealing with large molecules. Uh, it can be in the form of a linear polymer, which is the abundant uh, topology. Uh, and it can be in the form of a macrocyclic ring or a star uh, polymer. It can be in the form of a network structure, dendritic structure, even in butter brush. Um, however, not too many examples uh, around uh, show catenated structures much uh, more that of a nappy structure, simply because synthetically they're very hard to access. Uh, also, uh, constitutional isomerism uh, related to topology is a fascinating direction. In fact, as you can see in this uh, a view graph topology, macrocycles, polymacrocycles is the realm in which these chains can form interesting geometries or structures or different types of catenated links that uh, uh, enable one to form homopolymers or black polymers with interesting uh, chain properties and dynamics. The problem is these are more or less uh, very hard to obtain. Uh, or synthetically challenging to produce in high yields. Now, relating this to what we call knot theory, which is uh, a very important theory in mathematics, one is able to model this topology mathematically and uh, quantify them or identify them based on the number of crossover uh, or knottiness and the number of chains involved in the structure. So, for example, Trifold knot is an example of a 3-1 structure, meaning it's made up of one chain with three crossovers, or a 6-2 designation, meaning it's made up of actually two rings with six crossovers. And uh, what I've shown you earlier is actually a knot, a trifold knot, the first simplest trifold knot is called a trifold knot, is actually uh, a mirror image of each other, or there is a... Uh, um, um, chirality present. A simple ring is a trivial ring or an unknot. And as you can see here, uh, an unknot may have several crossovers, but actually if you can disentangle them uh, without breaking a bound and they form a simple unknot, then uh, it is uh, not a true knot. Uh, what we have in a supramolecular chemistry, I'm using this term now, uh, which is actually a fascination to a lot of organic chemists, is that you can make this triple knots, boromain ring, Solomon ring, or different knot structures simply by utilizing covalent and non-covalent interactions. Uh, it's also a challenge to make these different types of synthetic equivalents of a knot. But the problem is these are not very high molecular weights, and they do not involve 
propagation, initiation, as such we know with macromolecular chemistries, chemistries, but rather complexation or ring closure reactions that uh, give you uh, these oligomeric structures. Uh, so supramolecular chemistry is a very popular direction in materials and organic chemistry, but then they have not the capacity to form very high molecular weights. So let's look at some basic uh, directions uh, in making this entang controlled entanglements. So several synthesis strategies have been utilized for making catenates. One is you can have a statistical catenation, basically a ring and a linear chain. The linear chain treads through the center, so you will have this treading, and then finally with ring closure, you can form your first catenated structure. However, in reality, this is very hard to statistically control. In such a case, one uses templated direction, uh, directed catenation to form these structures. So, for example, you can have a donor acceptor or a hydrogen bonding interaction between the ring and the linear structure such that this is biased or favorably formed and then followed by uh, ring closure. This is a much better approach than the one above, which is statistical. And fortunately, uh, this is not entirely new. Uh, in fact, uh, many types of templates, whether it's metal base, donor acceptor, or hydrogen bonding, have been reported to bias the threading or catenation of uh, uh, different complexes so that you can have pre-ordering of that interaction. So several examples are given here, and they have been utilized to form structures uh, that are supramolecular in order. Uh, in fact, the uh, predictability of supramolecular templates and their nothingness can be uh, observed by looking at this programmable complexation. So for example, a catenated structure with one um, um, crossover will produce, upon ring closure, a catenated a simple structure called two catenine. On the other hand, if we uh, uh, double this uh, interaction by using a bidentate type of ligand and then closing the ring, you will end up with a, a link structure such that by demetallation or removal of metal ring, you will actually form a triple knot. Uh, so actually, uh, using this uh, type of um, table of programming, which was popularized by Sauvage, uh, one can predict the formation on knots on even numbered uh, uh, complexation. So, for example, two, four, six uh, will produce two knots, whereas one, three, five will not uh, produce knots. Uh, and to further um, uh, solidify this strategy. Um, this shows that a clipping strategy, uh, for example, uh, would come from the formation of these complex structures to form a catenated single structure. Or a triple knot uh, like this can come from the complexation of um, uh, two or three linkages. So uh, depending on the way they are crossed over and linked, you can either come up with a triple or a Solomon ring, or uh, two rings will end up uh, giving you a Borromean ring in a ring-to-ring -ring approach or a rack approach. In the essence, uh, this type of supramolecular structures are programmable, and therefore ring closure affords the completion of a ring formation. So the main question really I want to pose, and we will actually see a lot of AFM pictures uh, today, is first of all, is it possible to get high molecular weight polymers using a supramolecular chemistry approach? Now, a high polymer means we're talking about molecular weights of 20,000, 100,000, etc. These are called high polymers versus supramolecular molecule uh, that are assembled together, which can represent low molecular weight ligands. So the challenge with making high molecular weight polymer supramolecular uh, molecular structures is that uh, 
A high molecular weight polymer can have several ways of reinforcing or propagation, or basically these are competing reactions. If I have a um, long uh, polymer chain with two similar end groups, upon reinclosure with a second uh, chain with a compatible reactivity to the two end groups, I will have what we call a bimolecular homoidated functional approach. So statistically and thermodynamically, this is hard because you're basically competing here with the possibilities of four different sites of reaction. A unimolecular homoidated functional approach is a simpler case as well as the unimolecular heterodyne functional approach. In a sense, all you need is for the two end groups to meet, which can be done or present in dilute solutions. However, in a concentrated solution as shown here, this heterodyne functional approach actually can lead to high molecular weight linear polymers, which is a complete competing reaction with a dilute uh, solution. Uh, there are other cases, let's say with a uh, bimolecular homodyne functional approach in that you can have, um, instead of a simple reinclosure, you can have packing if you have an excess of the second reactant, or if you have less than stoichiometric equivalent, you can have, again, the possibility of a linear chain. Uh, this type of side reactions or reaction possibilities was summarized in an excellent the uh, article by Scott Grayson, uh, even back in 2009. Actually, a very interesting approach is to get a high molecular weight polymer. Is it, it is possible to start with a macro initiator or a macrocyclic initiator that then grows as a ring uh, in order to produce a high molecular weight. So what are the possible approaches to get a high molecular weight, not structured or patinated structure? That is basically uh, what we did uh, with the following papers that I'm going to show you to uh, you. Our plan then is to basically design uh, supramolecular templates that will allow us to obtain patinated and eventually a triple net structure and then use to correlate this with uh, different types of um, model structures that if we synthesize in high yields can be very useful to polymer physicists. On the other hand, we can have a lot of fun uh, with uh, characterizing these molecules and even in include atomic force microscopy as a valuable tool to prove the uh, synthesis of this type of structures. So the first paper we actually published was back in 2011 when we demonstrated the viability of a polymer patinated structure simply by utilizing a supramolecular uh, template and then growing a polymer arm by a reaction called ATRP. So the scheme looks like this. We can take a phenantrolin ligand, complex it with copper, so you have this representation too, whereas the end group actually contains a ATRP initiator. So the ATRP initiator is present on both uh, uh, four end groups, and then we will grow a polystyrene arm by polymerization. And then finally, using a ring closure ATRC reaction, end up with uh, uh, two rings that are catenated, and then Lastly, by decomplexation or removing that copper uh, ion, we will have a decomplex catenated structure as shown here. Now, in order to prove this, there are several things that we did. One is, since the copper complex is colored, uh, we can monitor it by UVB spectroscopy. So UVB spectroscopy showed that with the complex versus a decomplex system, uh, we can observe the peak at 437, 585, to compare the difference between the uh, ATRP initiator, decomplex, and complex. On the other hand, uh, by monitoring what happens to this peak before and after polymerization, again, we can prove that the polymerization takes place without a hitch, and we can preserve the uh, ligand to uh, metal interaction. Or in other words, the ring, I mean the ring per person as shown here, is preserved even after uh, polymerization. Um, 
we have a tool called gel permeation chromatography or sometimes called size exclusion chromatography that allows us to measure the molecular weight and the polydispersity of a synthesized polymer. So the results show here that the uh, polystyrene complex prior to a ring closure has this molecular weight and then the uh, polystyrene complex after closing the ring uh, shows here a lower hydrodynamic volume actually and then after removing the copper we can have again a higher hydrodynamic volume. Uh, so GPC is not only good for getting the molecular weight but is also an excellent tool for assessing changes in the hydrodynamic volume. What this tells us is that the ring closure was successful and that the presence of the metal actually forces the complex to form a, more, a lower hydrodynamic volume structure and then by removing the metal we get back a larger hydrodynamic volume polymer. But here's the wrap. Can we actually see the patinated polymers? So here's where atomic force microscopy is a valuable tool. As you can see here, a distribution of different types of patinated structures, rings, and linear polymers that is not uh, um, that was not uh, part of the ring closure reaction was actually observed by making a dilute solution cast of the product on a mica surface. So in fact, you can directly visualize here the catenated structures. The height shows where the overlap takes place. And we in fact observe some ring structures, some coincident or in, on top of the ring structures, and even some single polymer chains. And this shows proof that the reaction took place and also shows proof that some of the polymer chains were not actually uh, ring closed. In fact, uh, when we decomplex the um, uh, polymer and then observe it again by um, uh, GPC, again we can note we notice that uh, uh, there's a differentiation of the uh, molecular weight uh, before and after. Uh, that of the completion showing that some of the um, uh, free linear polymer chains were actually present. All right, so let's go to the next paper that we published back in 2012. Is it possible to make a black copolymer, which is a good illustration of a polymerization process in a um, com macro, com macro molecular uh, initiator template? So this is but an extension of the first paper in that if we can grow polystyrene and since the uh, chains are still active for further ATRP, we can introduce another monomer, in this case methylmethacrylate, to basically grow a polystyrene polymethylmethacrylate block and then re-close it to form this uh, catenated structure and then finally by removing the copper ion, we can decomplex it to form this high molecular weight black copolymer catenated structure. Again, uh, GPC is an excellent tool for us to differentiate this uh, uh, process from the homopolymer to the black copolymer. And in fact, it's interesting that we have a bi by um, modal type of uh, SCC chromatogram negating uh, some uh, of the polymers that, that react completely whereas the black polymer is formed. And then finally, by ring closure, we get this uh, um, polymer. And then lastly, by um, decomplexation, we can see the shift in the hydrodynamic volume. And the last step is by doing preparative GPC or dialysis. We're able to isolate the black polymer structure uh, and separate it from the homopolymer uh, um, uh, structure and so this represents that essentially of the pure uh, isolated black polymer catenated structure. I guess you uh, took a peek on the AFM image and again AFM is an ex excellent tool because we use this to characterize the formation of the black copolymers and so on mica and we can directly visualize here 
the block of polymer structures uh, by AFM. Now, this work was followed uh, or around 2015 with a what we call a click route to producing this um, um, molecular templates. So in this case, we produce a, a ligand template with an uh, acid uh, end group, reacting it with a triple bond uh, end group uh, ATRP polymerized uh, homopolymer. We can then click our way to produce the arms, use ATRC, and then finally enclosure and decomplexation, the production of catenated structures as shown here. Uh, some of the structures here involve that of side reactions or multiple aggregates of this material. But nevertheless, this close-up structure shows that it is possible to form uh, this homopolymer structures based on a quick reaction route. So all of these are what we call um, uh, reenclosure routes, reenclosure routes based on the formation of arms. Uh, a question I should pose then is, is it possible to form catenated structures by growing a ring or making a templated catenated structures and then essentially using a kinetically controlled ring expansion strategy to make a high molecular weight polymer? So indeed, uh, uh, this is viable. Uh, to describe this, uh, I showed earlier that it's possible to actually grow a catenated structure by doing the polymerization in situ. So in other words, we start with a ring template and then growing the polymer, in this case, a ring expansion approach utilizing a uh, cyclic monomer. You can grow the ring into a larger size. So the question is, can we combine uh, this ring closure route into a living linear polymerization route in order to grow uh, our own rings, okay? And the reason for that is by doing so, we can have high yield reactions, which will produce us a sizable polymer that can be used for uh, different types of applications, okay? Uh, so to demonstrate this, first we try to survey the different types of uh, uh, ring uh, uh, polymerization routes or ring expansion routes that have been reported. One was done by metathesis using a uh, uh, cyclooctene-based uh, derivative or by growing this tyrane derivative or even by uh, uh, raft polymerization. We settled to using a polycaprolactone ground, uh, meaning we can grow polycaprolactone using a thin dibutyl initiator and essentially in insert the caprolactone to grow the ring. Uh, so with this in mind, uh, the scheme shows that we can first form a thin butyl uh, templated initiator complex by copper. We can then uh, grow the ring uh, using a couple, uh, copper lactone monomer to form a large polycopper lactone catenated structure. And then finally decomplexing it to form the macromolecule. So this is how it looks like synthetically. We use the, again, the uh, popular phenantrolin ligand. We complex the two with copper. We then close the ring by inserting this thin dibutyl initiator. And then finally, since this, this thin butyl initiator can uh, be used for uh, polycopper lactone polymerization, we can then grow or expand this ring and insert polycopper lactone in between. So the scheme looks like this. Polycaprolactone uh, is grown from the caprolactone monomer. And we were successful in making this polymer. So first, I'll show you the uh, uh, NMR data that we obtained. Again, the NMR data is consistent with the initiator as, uh, as well as the caprolactone structure. Uh, and in fact, GPC was important for us to track this reaction. So first of all, with initiator, followed by the uh, insertion or polymerization of polycaprolactone. So you see the shift in the lower hydrodynamic volume or high molecular weight. And then by decomplexation, to our uh, surprise, we actually isolated some pre-polymer chains as well. So here we have the 
polymer catenated structure and the free polymer chains uh, observed. Now to separate these free polymer chains from the desired polymer, again we use dialysis or perforated GPC to isolate the product which is shown in the bottom curve. And then finally, again, uh, AFM is an excellent tool to visualize this interesting structures. So here you can see catenated structures by AFM uh, that we isolated both uh, coincident and both uh, uh, separated type of catenated structures. Now let me skip this view graph and directly go now to the last uh, model system that we, uh, we uh, reported. We, uh, we have reported different types of high uh, molecular weight the polycapri lactose synthesized this route. We even reported a polylactide uh, ring strategy as shown below. So again, uh, we, we utilize uh, this chemistry to produce high molecular weights of different uh, uh, compositions from um, 43 to 88 to 180 uh, degree of polymerization. And you can see the corresponding route in GPC. Uh, interestingly, we found good um, uh, crystalline peaks here, uh, quite different from that of a linear polycarbonate. Nevertheless, these are high yielding reactions that give us these catenated structures. Um, actually, uh, not only polycarbonate, but we've been able to demonstrate ring expansion through a raft polymerization route as shown here. Raft involves that of uh, uh, functional group that we call a chain transfer agent or CTA and in the presence of AIBM this allows us to do what we call reversible addition fragmentation chain transfer. In this case once we have this macro uh, rough CTA we then polymerize uh, uh, vinyl or polyvinyl carbazole to end up with ring structures. We prove this again with uh, GPC, um, uh, NMR, uh, even light scattering, and as shown here, again, AFM is vital to proving the cyclic and catenated structures uh, with a low molecular weight and a high molecular weight differentiation. Uh, so the last paper that I'm going to show you is how we ended up with a natty polymer using this ring expansion strategy. So a natty polymer is the first true nut or a sim the simplest nut that you can obtain by nut uh, theory. So to make the uh, supramolecular initiator, what we need is a bidentate ligand and a copper and essentially making this uh, crossover to form this uh, complex and then finally closing the ring. And as you've uh, seen earlier, we can put thin dibutyl initiators for polycaprolactone at these end groups to produce a supramolecularly templated macro initiator. We then grow the ring by ring opening polymerization using caprolactone and then finally by decomplexation we should end up with a triple nut. So to uh, show you the actual structures that we synthesize, as you can see here, we utilize a diphenantrolin ligand complex it with two equivalents of copper. We close the ring with a thin uh, dibutyl initiator and then by polymerizing caprolactone we inserted polycaprolactone between these two chains. Again, uh, several ways to prove this. Uh, we looked at UVVIS, NMR, and even XPS to prove that the thin and the copper were present on the uh, macro initiator. After polymerization, we can uh, go through this together. By GPC, the polymer molecular weight was observed to increase by also looking at the decomplexation um, bacteria, we found the presence of an, uh, uh, chains that were not uh, uh, properly closed together with the closed uh, uh, chains and then finally by uh, separating the two together using preparative GPC, we're able to isolate the product one. 
Um, so this is the expected product. NMR proved that the polymer indeed was formed. Uh, even by UVBIS, we can show you that the uh, complexation was uh, was preserved um, because of the presence of the peaks at 4, 2, 7, and 518 wave na nanometers. And then finally, by decomplexation, uh, these peaks disappear. Uh, in fact, uh, we can compare the analog between the linear and the natted polymer by simply synthesizing a polycaprolacto linear derivative, uh, comparing that of a lower hydrodynamic natted polymer. So as you can see here, these two derivatives are in fact of the same molecular weight, but because the natted polymer is smaller, uh, it appears to have a higher, hydro, uh, a higher uh, retention volume and therefore a lower hydrodynamic volume, okay? And so this just completely tells, tells us that this uh, polymer that we said we will synthesize is actually a ring structure, a macrocyclic structure. But then the question is, is it really a triple nut polymer as we claim? So this is where AFM again proved to be a very important tool. So by AFM we actually observed the first triple knot structures of polycaprolactone. And this was done by screen casting a very dilute solution of the product on mica. Upon closer examination, again, you can see the triple knot structure here. And very hard to guess which is left-handed or right-handed. The main thing is the triple knot structure are accessible, can be proven by other uh, indirect methods, but a direct investigation of the supramolecular structure was only made or made possible by utilizing atomic force microscopy. So this is the first triple knot of a polycaprolactone structure. So what I have shown you in this last uh, 45 minutes is basically a route to prepare what we call supramolecular polymers or the utilization of supramolecular natted macro initiator to produce high molecular weight polymers of uh, catenated homopolymers or catenated blockopolymers or catenated uh, polymers by ring expansion strategy. And then finally, the last paper that I showed you um, clearly demonstrates that it's feasible to synthesize the first knotty polymer utilizing this supramolecular template approach. And then AFM, as I've shown you, is a vital tool to directly observe these supramolecular structures uh, um, from uh, mica surfaces and therefore gives us a direct evidence of the formation of uh, these fascinating polymers. So with that, I'd like to thank you and I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Gerald? Very good. Thank you, Professor. So um, while we wait for questions to be typed into the queue here, um, and please, by all means, everyone, uh, use the questions module to type in any questions you may have about what was just presented. Uh, so while we wait for those to come into the pipeline, we actually have a question here from our local audience, uh, Professor, about the last image that you showed about the uh, polycaprolactone. Okay. Um, first, the question was, uh, what what again was the substrate underneath polycaprolactone molecule? We uh, we mainly utilize mica uh, because of its uh, atomic flatness to uh, uh, observe these structures. We've used in the past as well uh, float glass and silicon vapor, but uh, uh, this is this is actually a, a hit or miss thing for us to observe these structures because first of all you need to preserve the triple knot without uh, um, uh, aggregating by uh, spreading it in a very, very dilute solution. And then we try to understand the surface interaction of the polymer itself to the surface. So it can be a, a hydrophobic interaction or an ionic interaction if you can induce one. And, and then finally, uh, I guess we're lucky, we can end up observing the three point nut structure uh, separated from each other individually. And then a follow-up question on that is also related to the same slide you have up. So uh, we're looking at the inset image where it's slightly zoomed in. 
uh, right in the lower uh, or the middle of the slide rather. And right. we're we're wondering if the um, the gradations, the lines that you see underneath the trefoil knot, are, is that the lattice structure of the mica? Um, I uh, I would like to say so, uh, but uh, also I would add there there's a component that um, the imaging method we have is not optimized. Uh, so in fact, um, one can do some type of Fourier transform uh, analysis or subtraction to get a, a better representation. Uh, so those are the two possibilities. Uh, I, I believe that uh, we can, you know, we can probably do a better job with a sharper tip or a, uh, a better AFM, uh, uh, better substrate preparation. All right, thank you. Um, so we actually have one, the first question coming from the online audience here. Uh, it reads, is there a difference in the uh, uh, TG between the knotty polymer and the linear analog? Very good question. There is. And uh, I'd refer you to uh, the paper that we publish. Um, let's see. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the things we, we strive is to get high molecular weight samples that you can actually measure the TG. Most of the uh, previously reported polymer routes do not give enough sample even to do a simple melting point experiment or, or much less uh, you know, extensive uh, thermal analysis. But yes, the, uh, the answer we have, let's say for the catenated structure, and I'm just looking for the uh, uh, macromolecules paper here. Yeah, probably this reference here. We published this paper in macromolecules uh, last year, and uh, we showed that uh, you can get actually a lower um, PG with a catenated structure uh, and uh, the melting point changes as well. So uh, a lot of that I reported uh, on this paper, and you're, you're welcome to uh, get a hold of this paper and observe the differences we we've seen with the linear versus the catenated analogs. Okay, great. So um, we still have a couple minutes here before the session is scheduled to end, so please um, continue sending in your questions. Um, if you still need a couple more moments to type, I do have a couple announcements to make. Uh, so the first one's going to be related to this nanomaterials webinar series. So this is the webinar for March. Uh, if you're wondering what we're going to be talking about next time, which is going to be on April 7th, we're looking at a topic of uh, stimuli-responsive polymers, and that, again, will be on April 7th. Stimuli-responsive polymers here with Professor Advincula. And um, if you saw the announcement, we also uh, started a secondary series uh, with a different speaker, uh, and that's going to be based on uh, mostly... Uh, Analytical Methods in Electrochemistry, and that's with Professor Lane Baker of Indiana University. Uh, Professor Baker is taking the month off this time, but he'll be returning uh, in April with uh, a talk on electrochemical um, electrochemistry scanning probes. So he'll be talking about SECM as well as uh, scanning ion conductance microscopy. And that's going to be, again, uh, not this month. He'll be taking this month off, but also in April. Um, so... Um, let me go ahead and also direct you guys to parkafm.com. If uh, you weren't already aware, uh, we actually keep recordings of all of the uh, um, webinars that Professor Advincula and other speakers do for us online. So if uh, you have a colleague or if you're an academia and you have students or other members in your group who would like to um, watch these, uh, these recordings, uh, we have them all available, and I'm going to send them into the chat here. Parkafm.com, we have uh, the Nano Academy section, and all of our webinars are uh, hosted up onto YouTube, and you'll find streaming links there. Pretty handy if you've missed one or uh, you saw a, a topic in the past that, uh, that is up your alley. So hopefully you get a chance to check that out. Um, it doesn't look like any questions have landed in the interim into the questions queue, so um, I believe we can go ahead and proceed with any closing thoughts. Uh, do you have any, Professor? 
Well, I, I hope I've been of help to uh, some of you who are very uh, interested with uh, uh, utilizing AFM as a probe for supermolecular chemistry or, or the synthetic route of uh, uh, high molecular weight polymers. And I'd be happy to uh, answer any of your emails. If uh, you email me directly or even directly to Jerry Alvin, I'm sure I'll get it. So, um, yeah, I'd be happy to uh, interact with you. Just email me. Wonderful. Um, could you please put up the uh, the title slide again, Professor? I guess uh, just in case anyone needs to get a hold of your uh, email address. And as for my email address, I will send it into the chat. Again, my name is Gerald. And if you have any questions about Park Systems Atomic Force Microscopy or any of the SPM modes that our systems offer, uh, definitely visit parkafm.com. Uh, you can additionally send uh, any questions about the webinar series uh, to my email address, gerald at parkafm.com. And as you can see on the title slide, you can reach um, Professor Vincula's uh, group at either rcapoly.net, that's the group website, or you can email the professor directly at rca41 at case.edu. So uh, with that, I believe that draws our time to a close. Uh, and I hope to see you, each and every one of you next time on behalf of the professor as well as everyone here at Park Systems. Thank you, and we'll see you again soon. Goodbye, everyone.